So it turns out that we don't have to read or watch science fiction to explore the realities. Apparently, all you have to do is learn another language. Welcome back to another episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less, your basement-based source for anthropological inquiry. I'm your host, Michael Kilman, and today we're going to talk about the Sapir Whorf Hypothesis. No, not this guy. These guys. Now, before we get started today, just know that this is one of those contentious issues that has quite a bit of debate around it. And I'm not sure there's any clear-cut answers here that's okay. Sometimes anthropology and science in general is about asking difficult questions about the nature of being human. But let's dive in. It's pretty obvious to just about anybody that human beings aren't born with a specific language. We spend the first several years of our lives acquiring vocabulary and communication skills. And that differs depending on where you're born. But how does this all relate to culture? Well, in 1929, a man by the name of Edward Sapir published an article called The Status of Linguistics as a Science. And in it, he said that language is a guide to social reality. It, quote, powerfully conditions all of our thinking about social problems and processes. Human beings do not live in an objective world alone, nor alone in a world of social activity as ordinarily understood, but are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. Basically, how we structure our lives is navigated through language, the kinds of family we have, religion, economics, love relationships, gender identities, and so on. In the same passage, Sapir goes on to say, quote, the fact of the matter is that the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built upon the language and habits of the group. The world in which different societies live are distinct worlds, not merely the same world with different labels attached. The peers' claim is basically that different language equals different worlds of perception, and that language is basically like a code for perceiving the world on a conscious but mostly subconscious level. Remember, we talked about this in episode 3 on cultural appropriation. Most of your interactions and perceptions are based on subconscious assumptions that you and your culture have built over many lifetimes. So where does Worf come in? Well, in 1939, one of Edward Sapir's students, Benjamin Lee Worf, published an article called The Relationship of Habitual Thought and Behavior to Language. And in it, he demonstrated that European language had radically different concepts of time from the Hopi tribe of the American Southwest which he argued this difference in perception of time shaped the way that the Hopi and the European languages changed things like subsistence patterns and kinship patterns. Then, in 1940, a year after Edward Sapir died, Worf took this theory to another step. And in his article, Science and Linguistics, he claimed that some of the ethnic groups in the subarctic had over a hundred terms for sea ice and snow. By the way, this idea was heavily contested in the 1980s and 90s, but was eventually vindicated by anthropologist Igor Krupnik in his 2010 book, Knowing Our Ice, where he demonstrated that in fact the Yupik people in Alaska had well over 100 words for sea ice alone. As a result of his ideas, and inspired by Einstein, Worf coined the term linguistic relativity, meaning basically that the way you structure your language relates to how you perceive and interact with the world. Also, I should quickly note that we aren't sure if Edward Sapir would have been fully on board with Worf's ideas. He didn't publish them till after he died, but even still, the ideas became known as the Sapir-Worf hypothesis, giving credit to both men for their contributions to the idea. So before I go on to some case studies, I want to say that not everybody is sold on this idea. And there are some problems with Sapir Whorf, such as, one, we can't get inside people's heads and see what they're thinking. I mean, not yet anyway. Two, everyone has thoughts that we can't fully express in language, right? Of course, we sometimes find a way to communicate them, but not always. Three, the hypothesis seems to indicate that there isn't any kind of universality to human cognition, that either all brains aren't created equal, or that language shapes the brain much more radically than traditionally thought. So the debate here is over whether or not the brain is really that plastic. And also, one of the main opponents of Sapir Whorf is a pretty famous linguist by the name of Noam Chomsky, who spent a great deal of his career arguing that human beings have a kind of universal grammar and cognition, that all languages have certain structures embedded within them because of the way the brain is made up. A quick word aside, Chomsky's ideas were also challenged in 2005 by anthropologist Daniel L. Everett in an intensely contested publication called Cultural Constraints on Grammar and Cognition in the Piraha, where Everett showed that the Piraha, an admittedly small indigenous group in the Amazon, didn't seem to conform to Chomsky's theory of universal grammar. There was, as a result, a war of words. 
over the significance of their language, which is still hotly disputed by both sides. So let's take a look at some case studies surrounding Sapir Wharf. Oops, not a real case study, but an excellent piece of science fiction that does surround the Sapir Wharf hypothesis. In fact, they even mention it in the film. It is a documented fact that not every culture has the same concept for colors. In fact, there are many cultures that only recognize light and dark, and some who only recognize three to five colors, and some like us who have a whole damn box of Crayolas. Take for example the Kandoshi tribe of the Upper Amazon Basin. In 2016, anthropologist Alexandre Sereyas published an article titled On the Contrastive Perception and Ineffability, Accessing Sensory Experience Without Color Terms in the Amazonian Society. Basically, Sarai has argued that even though this particular tribe engaged with the use of a variety of colors in their art, they didn't have terms for it. In fact, he argued that they don't even have a word or concept for color, even though they use them. But they do compare them to things like fish spawn or the ripeness of fruit. And critics say, what's the difference here? We call an orange an orange, right? But this opens another debate that's related to Sapir Wharf. Are colors a universal experience? Is the perception of color the same across culture? If we go by language alone, it doesn't appear so, because as I said before, not every culture makes the same color distinctions. But biologically, we do see that infants have a kind of universal color perception. For example, in 2012, a research paper titled Language is Not Necessary for Color Categories, eight-month-old infants were tested for color perception by using eye tracking and colors. The study seemed to find that these infants have at least some color perception before language. However, the study so far has not been conducted in some of the cultures that challenge the idea of universal color in the first place. That probably should be done. And a 2008 study suggested that learning a new color and name seems to rewire the cognition circuits in the brain by moving perceptions of the color from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere of the brain. What does that mean? Well, it could mean that color perception is not innate and that it's something that is learned through language, or it could relate to memory and cognition. The truth is that when it comes to Sapir Whorf and color, it's pretty inconclusive. And part of this is because it's really hard to quantify experience. A few other interesting case studies show that both emotions and personality may vary depending on what language the speaker is using. For example, a 1990 study showed that bilingual English-Spanish speakers demonstrated more intense emotions when using Spanish, regardless of which was their first language. A 2002 and 2006 study showed that bilingual speakers changed some of their answers and even appeared to exhibit different personality traits depending on which language they were using. The linguists in these studies suggested that using a different language suggested a kind of cultural frame switching, meaning that the individuals actually change their interpretations of the world based on their language. But does this mean that the speakers are experiencing an entirely different reality based on their language? I don't know. Could be the case, but maybe not. The experiments above show that there is some sort of relationship between your language and the way that you engage with the world. It also impacts just what kind of knowledge you can have in the first place. And there's definitely some interplay between language and culture, but researchers have been fighting about exactly what that relationship is for more than a century now. The point of all this is that language is extraordinarily powerful. The expression, the pen is mightier than the sword, definitely has some truth to it. I mean, politicians, political pundits, interest groups spend a lot of time and money using language to persuade you on a number of contentious issues and are pretty good at it. Think of all the recent discussions of fake news, echo chambers, confirmation bias. In some cases, if you're on the left or right side of the issue, you seem to radically perceive the world differently. Lastly, it's absolutely true that some concepts don't really translate well into other languages. In other words, the original meaning is completely lost in the translation because there's no concrete way to translate it. A notable example is the Buddhist term sunyata, which translates roughly to emptiness or voidness. But that's not what it means at all. It's a term that attempts to describe the nature of the self or reality. Or how about ghosts? You might think that every culture has a concept for ghost, but you'd be wrong. In her classic article, Shakespeare in the Bush, anthropologist Laura Bohannon figures out pretty quickly that trying to teach the Tiv tribe of Africa, Hamlet, ran into some pretty sticky translation issues. For one, they didn't even have a concept for ghosts. They simply couldn't understand the concept and insisted that Bohannon didn't know what she was talking about or making it up. In fact, at the conclusion of the article, they suggest that she take her new and corrected knowledge back to her American elders to clarify everything for them. And sure, if you spend time with a term or a concept, you might come to understand some elements of it, but it's very interesting that some cultures lack ideas while others have them. That says a lot about the fact that language and culture have a kind of relationship. And like culture, language is perfectly capable of changing. But that's all for now on this episode of Anthropology in 10 or Less. 
We'll see you next time.